You are listening to the Brought to Light Masonic Podcast, a podcast for Freemasons and the public generally, bringing you to light through discussions and research papers about Australian Freemasonry and the Victorian jurisdiction in particular. Welcome back to the Brought to Light Masonic Podcast. This is your host, Brother Jack Aquilina, here for episode six of the Brought to Light Masonic Podcast, which is really good because we're now at a point now where we've covered, after this episode, the three craft degrees in Freemasonry, um, which will be hopefully helpful for our listeners. I'm joined today by a familiar voice, Brother Steve Austin, who was our host last week. Thanks for coming back on, Steve. Not a problem, Jack. Glad to be here. How are you today? Yeah, good, good. Keeping busy. I, I know that you had a lot of fun last week um, with uh, with the interview with, with uh, James, and obviously it was good to hear your story about we, you know, how you joined Freemasonry and, yeah. and all the rest, and obviously we couldn't keep you away. We've got you back. Basically, Steve, uh, today we're going to be focusing on the third degree to finish that journey we've been doing going through the three craft degrees. And we've a got a memorable moment. Memorable moment, yes. Where did you do your third degree? Uh, it was at my mother lodge in Plenty Valley, uh, which met, uh, met at Ivalda in uh, Darabin. Uh, I think it's just gone past the sixth anniversary of that. Actually. Six years since you became a Master Mason. Yeah. It's, a, it's a really important thing, isn't it, when you become a Master Mason? It really transitions you from you know being a, a sort of a half member through to being a fully respected, yeah. fully fledged member of the yes, organisation. Yes, it does. It gives you those... Like, uh, the closing off or the tie, the tying off of uh, the three degrees, and uh, explains a lot. But again, starts you thinking about where you want to take this. Yeah, where do you want to go with your Masonic career? We've got Worshipful Brother Brendan Kai coming in today from the Victorian Lodge of Research. We'll be talking about the third degree. He's a very interesting fellow. Yes, uh, and it should be a really, really good interview because Brendan offers that. Um, and the reason we've asked him to come is because Brendan offers that um, sort of esoteric symbolism he, yes. he looks beyond the veil to use that term and he focuses yes. on some of the more occult and uh, esoteric aspects of degrees yes uh, very proficient researcher and uh, we thought because the third degree is so different to the other two degrees we'd get him in to sort of give a bit of an insight into some of the underlying themes and how it relates to some of the other sort of mystic and religious traditions out there and ties into modern day life too i think you'll uh, round that off uh, to the non-Masons that are listening to uh, uh, give it a bit more about why we're talking in those uh, riddles, if so to speak, that can apply to the real everyday life. I think you're right. I think that the for the listeners out there who are non-Masons, that the opportunity of this interview is that you're going to hear how Freemasonry ties into a broader school of philosophy and religion and culture and, and, and the idea that you know we borrow our traditions from all these little areas of traditions and we try and teach our values in a way that is philosophical so hopefully you get a taste of that let's talk a bit about news um so there's been a big change here with with the brought to light masonic podcast being a part of the blue land social club uh, we've had a restructure and i foreshadow that last meeting but i want to sort of go into a bit more detail and discuss a bit of news steve you are now uh, the district president the northern district president of the blue land social club correct uh, which means you, you're taking up that step. You were the Ivalda representative for yes. us. And um, obviously, we've gone through a lot of change. We've got the Northern District with Steve and his team. We've got yes. the, the Maroondah District with Fina and his team. And we've also got the Greater Gippsland region with Simon and, 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 and Rob and their team out there. Yeah. Yes. What, are you, what are your plans for the Blue Lounge? What's the sort of things you want to achieve in the North? And what have you been doing that we like? And what's some other things you want to sort of do from here? Well, the initiative we've started which we're going to continue on with we'll be uh, getting uh, young faces or young brethren out to uh, initiations or first degrees um, so when they are brought to light they, uh, they're not saying just uh, the older masons in the room they, they're saying that there is uh, that younger generation here and it's uh, Freemasonry is here to stay um, and it's an initiative that was started by yourself and I Jack uh, as a rep and uh, so we'll be continuing that and uh, the the uh, district coordinator and the uh, representatives who I met with last night are very excited uh, about where we're going, uh, and obviously we'll still be running the uh, the theme the theme every month, the theme uh, once every quarter, sorry, and then the uh, lecture, and then a uh, 
pub crawl loosely term. Uh, we don't crawl from pub to pub. We just have a, a more informal gathering, which is actually later today. Uh, yeah. We have one in the Melbourne CBD uh, to make it a bit more accessible to uh, some interested parties from other districts that want to come and see us, uh, what we're about. And I believe the interest is looking at uh, we're possibly going to be getting 40 to 50 people there for a two-part function today. We're at a pool table room at the Bull and Bear in uh, Flinders Lane. And uh, we're going out for dinner, a, a set course dinner at a restaurant. It was also run by another Freemason. Uh, so we've got a good deal there. So it'll be a good social day and uh, yeah. we've got a lot of people coming. And you, you, I know that yourself and worshipful brother uh, Dominic Donato organised this event today. So you, yes. you put a lot of work into it. And this is the last sort of um, non-district event. This is Blue Lounge was non-district based before. Yeah. It was just an initiative that was sort of trying to gain traction. And now that we've got ingrained in the districts, the districts are going to be holding their own meetings. So yes. there might be three meetings at the Blue Lounge every month. Yes. Um, which is going to be good fun. And, and like you said, every district is going to take on their own theme. You're going to yeah. continue with the pub crawl, the lecture night and the rest. Yeah. But... This is maybe our, change it up. I maybe change know. it up. We'll yeah. see how it goes. And, and and this sort of this meeting today is sort of like, it's not a it's it's it's, it's like a transition now. We're going yes. from our single meetings to the new structure. Well, that's all we organised it in the CBD. So we, we'll we'll be getting guys from the Maroona district there today, and possibly a couple of guys from Gippsland are coming up as well, uh, which is they travel a long way. And uh, growing up in the country myself, I uh, understand the the distance and. Uh, it's a little, it's a different comprehension for for regional people. So how, how great are they, Simon and and, and Rob? Those yeah. guys out there. They're well, we met them in Warrigal, and they they live another uh, half an hour, an hour past Warrigal. So we travelled an hour and a half, and they travelled half an hour or so themselves. So um, yeah, so it, it's it, it's it's commitment, and uh, I mean we'll get down to their events. I don't believe. Uh, Maroondah are launching next month and so are they. Yeah, so I mean, I've, I've announced that, that the Maroondah District is going to be hosting its inaugural Blue Lounge event at the Inner Eastern Masonic Centre or the Box Hill Masonic Centre on the 3rd of September. Now, the night's going to be a lot of fun. There's going to be a launch party with you know all the usual refreshments and finger food. There's also going to be a band and I believe the theme of the night is going to be a trivia night. So that'll be good fun. Trivia. Trivia. A bit of dust up on the Google apps. Exactly right. No, no, your stuff. Um, I'll be taking on the role. I have taken on the role as state president. So I've, I, I leave my little baby behind, and I become sort of the head of the organisation, a state perspective. Yes. Um, which is which is a different challenge. So we're, we're, the Blue Lands are going through a different structure. From the Blue Lot Brought to Light perspective, all it's going to mean is extra resourcing and support for this podcast. This is yes. an initiative of the Blue Lounge Social Club. We'll be getting some very exciting episodes coming up. I'll just foreshadow that before we commence our interview with Brendan. What we're going to do is we don't want this podcast just to be about reading research papers. We want this to be discussion-based. Yes. But we also want this to provoke some intellectual ideas. So what we're going to do, Steve, is in the coming weeks, we're going to start what we're going to call contested discussions, like a debate. It's going to be a civil discussion between two members of Freemasonry or might be outside Freemasonry to talk about some of the ideas that we deal with. For example, why don't we let women into the organisation? It's a uh, often asked question, isn't it? Exactly right. Why don't we let atheists? Um, are certain religions compatible with our with, with our organisation? Uh, are we truly a progressive side? So these questions, yes, we're going to have speakers come in for and against. There'll be a moderated interview, and the idea is not to offend anyone, but it's to stimulate debate and yes. ideas and discussion. So a lot coming in store for the Brought to Light and Sunday podcast. Thank you very much to our listeners who keep listening, and thank you for all your support. Well, I think Steve, without further ado. We're going to jump into the interview with uh, Worshipful Brother Brendan Kine about the third degree. Looking forward to it. So we're here today with uh, Worshipful Brother Brendan Kine of the Victorian Lodge of Research, who's kindly come in to dedicate his time to talk about the third degree today. Uh, we've decided to invite you, Brendan, because last two weeks we've had Worshipful Brother James Tog, who's done a fantastic job talking about some of the more practical elements of the first and second degree. And we thought that we'd have you come in to talk about more of the esoteric symbolism that underlies the third degree, because it's such a unique degree in comparison to the other two. So anyway, before we get into the third degree, let's learn a little bit about you, Brendan. Um, where, do, where do you come from? Why did you join Freemasonry? Um, I'm a local boy. I um, haven't moved far from home in the general area. Uh, I'd say it was about 12 years before I joined Freemasonry. I've always had an interest in history. I think it might have been Dame Frances Yates' book, Rosicrucian Enlightenment. 
where she mentions the influence of Freemasonry in various European events of the period. And I just started following that path and guess I never stopped. So you've always had an interest in sort of history, and obviously was was the occult a natural extension of that? Or? I'm not so much the occult, but where the story of Freemasonry went down the path of, say, the Rosicrucians or the Alchemists or the Hermeticists. And then you end up going back to early Christianity and the Gnostics. It, it's a journey. It if is. you actually yeah. study the history of Freemasonry, it actually becomes a journey and you don't realise it. Yeah, yeah. Um, how did I join Freemasonry? A good friend of mine rang up one day and said, hey, have you got your local newspaper there? And I said, yeah, it's already in the bin. He said, fish it out, go to page whatever, and there's a little ad that said, do you want to know more about Freemasonry? And I said, oh, do you want to go along? He said, yeah, we'll go <laughs> along. Um, and we both joined. Simple as that? Simple as that. So some advertising work for a change? Uh, it did. We went along and kind of thought, oh, yeah, this, this looks cool. We'll give it a shot. Yep. Um, unfortunately, my friend has just rejoined from oh, Freemasonry. Sorry to hear that. Well, he's actually joined the Gnostics. He oh, joined Freemasonry. Okay. Through Freemasonry, actually became more religious. Yes and has now left Freemasonry is happily in the Gnostics. Well, I know the Gnostic tradition has um, become, got more traction, and I know that with the discovery of some documents recently, they've sort of revived their traditions, in a, in a sense, from the public image. Uh, and he enjoys it. He finds stuff in the Gnostics that he was looking for in Freemasonry yeah. and didn't find. Yeah, I can see the parallel between that. And which, when you joined, which lodge was your mother lodge? Which one did you uh, join? Gordon Lodge in Mooney Ponds. It still meets in Mooney Ponds? Still meets in Mooney Ponds. Um, beauty of Gordon Lodge is it was the first lodge in Melbourne to build its own lodge building. Oh, wow. 1886, wow. it's the first Melbourne lodge building and we still meet in it. And it's a, it's a, it's a lovely lodge room. And I mean, I mean, uh, unfortunately... Time and etc. is taking its toll on the building and being, you know, 40 odd members, we can no longer afford yeah. to upkeep, so we've yeah. got to make some tough, tough deci decisions. But it seems like that's happening more and more, isn't it? Um, well, it is. Once upon a time, you could afford to operate a building like that. These days, it's a lot more expensive when you've got your rates and your land tax being fifteen, twenty thousand dollars mm. $20,000. For a lodge, you've got to generate a lot of income yes. to keep it running. Well, hopefully we can get a few members for Gordon Lodge so we can uh, ease that pain. But um, in terms of the, in terms of, you so say you said you joined based on that advertising, you already had an interest in history, mm -hmm. you joined Gordon Lodge, and then how did you find your way to the Victorian Lodge of Research? Uh, well, that was just a natural fit, wasn't it? I mean, I, I had all this bubbling knowledge of Freemasonry and the only lodge around that could satisfy that that urge was the Lodge of Research, because your, your average lodge, there's never all that much discussion of those issues, because mm, yeah. they have other business in mind, and it very rarely gets a look in. Yeah, um, so yeah. I go to research and find every month they have discussions about, free <laughs> where do I sign up? They actually talk about free research. Yeah, and, it, and yeah. I was quite lucky that actually at my initiation, there was a member of the lodge there. Oh, okay. And he's come up to me and said, Hello. you should come and visit us. <laughs> it's funny you say that. I mean, yeah. I, same thing happened at, uh, I'm a member of two craft lodges, and Western Street United Lodge just had a wonderful member who joined. He's been a member of the non-Masonic Rosicrucians okay. for about 25 years. So he's decided late to join Freemasonry. And uh, the other night, there was actually two gentlemen from the Lodge of Research there, and I automatically drew the link for him because I know that he's got that interest that he's probably not going to get necessarily in an ordinary craft lodge. No. Um, but uh, like you said, it, it provides that avenue. And you're secretary there at the moment, aren't you? At the no, 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 I, I have no. You have no office, so no you, you're office. one of the smart ones. Yeah, so I have you, no office. You go along and just enjoy. Oh, actually, the I have an unofficial office, and that's what they call it, lecture master. Oh, so wonderful. basically, I organise the year's program. Yeah, and the year's program is organised a year in advance. Obviously. Yeah, yeah, I'm finalising next year's Oh, now. really? Oh, yeah. wow. And uh, in terms of the people, in terms of their... I know that you guys have people come along and do papers, is that correct? Yeah. And they have a discussion about those yep. papers. What happens? Do they get published? Or they do. At the end of each year, we publish all of those papers in a glossy little annual transactions. This year is our 30th edition of those glossy little yep, transactions. Yep, yep. Um, and they go right around the world. That's good. Um, that's good advertising for the Lodge, too, and... Unfortunately, in about Australia and New Zealand, we're the last one that seems to be actively yeah, pumping out on. research papers. Yeah, I was talking to a friend of mine who runs a podcast called Whence Came You, uh, Robert Johnson, and uh, he's very involved with his lodge of research in uh, Illinois. But the issue they've been having is that what they've been finding is they produce all this wonderful, wonderful research, and then you see it shelved on a bookshelf and mm -hmm. dust collects, and then all this work just gets lost. Yes. Uh, so I guess... Uh, that was uh, our point in... Well, 
well, I wasn't around then, but years ago in publishing it. So yeah. th it is out there. I think even in this building there is a set of our transactions there. And there's some great stuff in it. There's some crap too, but it depends on, <laughs> your, you know, one man's crap to another man's exactly gold. Exactly right, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So you guys are proactively trying to get the stuff out there is the point that... Uh, oh, yeah, and, and I um, hunt around. I, I come across brethren who, like yourself, produce papers and stuff, and I remember that, and I think, right, I'm coming back to you at some point. <laughs> <laughs> They're on their list. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's the way. Well, good. Well, thank you very much for providing that background. It's good that's to right. sort of know a little bit more about the Victorian Lodge of Research because I think it's really important. And what we're trying to do with this podcast is give an avenue to you know the Victorian Lodge of Research and other guys to sort of uh, touch base with their research and information with a younger generation, which is um, hungry for information. I find most people who join Freemasonry these days are very, very well researched. And, yeah, and that's one reason we run that Certificate of Masonic Studies course. Yes, you do, don't you? Yes, yes that's right. Um, Let's talk about that. Um, um, and that captures the interest of our newer members. Um, and we, it wasn't the intention of it, but we find we get a lot of new members of the Lodge finish the course and go, hang on, I want to be a part of this Lodge because yeah, yeah, yeah. you're doing this different stuff. Yeah. Um, it's an eight-module course, four on history, four on symbolism, Freemasonry's relationship with religion, that sort of thing. Yep. So, um, you attend a tutorial once a month and you've got to answer some questions. Yeah, and you write like, a paper every month or something. Or yeah, you answer these yeah. questions. up to you, though, how much detail you want to yep. give. One page is the minimum, Yep. but some people, like one guy a couple of years ago, was giving me 90, 100-page works with appendices. Oh, wow. Now, if he wants to go to that much effort, that's fine, because I'll read it and enjoy it and yeah. actually publish some of it if it's any good. It must be rewarding, uh, having that opportunity to sort of read other people's work. Oh, it is, it is. And I'm now getting stuff from all around the country. There's a young guy in New South Wales yeah. who I must put you in touch yeah, with. Yeah, it'd be great, yeah. Um, who's writing some fabulous papers. He's just a fellow craft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the insights he's producing, you just think, this is fabulous. You, you're right, and there's so many... Um, we, had a, we had a guy at our lodge uh, do a presentation on the... Um, he's an actor by trade and he did a presentation on comparison between Freemasonry and the old uh, sort of acting traditions they used to do back in ancient Greece. You know, yes. The plays and the idea of communicating through ritual and, and acting and stories and I thought that was fascinating. I'll have to get him on to you so he can Well, well people up. have always made that connection with Freemasonry and in particular the third degree with the old mystery plays. Yep, yep. Where every year villages and stuff would have annual mystery plays and certain guilds would be assigned a certain mystery play oh, yeah. every year to present. Yes, yes. And quite often you see that the Masons were given the one round Solomon's Temple <laughs> or something. <laughs> yeah, yep. So you can almost see where possibly, and I'm just saying possibly, possibly yeah. where some of this has evolved from. Where those traditions come from. Well, I think on that note we'll get straight into it. Let me just put in the usual disclaimer. The views here expressed are the views of the individual participants. There is no right or wrong, although some people may disagree with that. Um, and also, it just doesn't represent any Grand Lodge or any Grand Lodge body. Um, we're completely independent. But that's the best thing about symbolism, isn't it, Brendan? That yes, you can interpret it any way in the world. And, and that's one of the benefits of Freemasonry. And this is where anti-Freemasons get all caught up. We have no set dogma. Hmm. So if you and I say something about the third degree, you can't go, Freemasons believe this. Yes, yes that's true. You can't pinpoint that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's just our personal interpretation of it. Well, I hope you enjoy... I hope the listeners enjoy our personal interpretations. Um, what we've done is we've put together a list of things we want to get through. I've let, I'm going to let Brendan have the floor, and I'll intervene where we can. Uh, but I'll just start you off, Brendan. Let's talk about... Let's introduce the third degree to our listeners who may not be that familiar with Freemasonry, maybe members of the public who are interested... How does it fit in with the other two degrees? Um, we, a lot of people sort of read up that it's very different, and that's a, that's a fair thing to say, I think. Give us an idea of the third degree, maybe a bit of its history, and how you think it fits in the whole craft structure. Uh, well, as you mentioned, Jack, yes, there are three degrees in Freemasonry. Um, if we want to leap about a little in the questions here, there's a good suggestion that 300 years ago there was only two degrees. We know from the early Scottish stonemasons, they only had a two-degree ceremony. And that's fairly sure, but we kind of get the, the, the kind of inclination that around the 1720s, this newly established Grand Lodge of London created a third degree. Um, now, whether or not they've used existing material, one quite prominent school here... Uh, in Freemasonry in the 1950s 
was that they took existing material and chopped two into three. Um, others say, no, what they've done is just grab material from other, where, other places and create it. We don't know mm, yeah, whether yeah. it's a, an artificial creation or whether they've used existing material and chopped it up. What we do know is that there are Scottish lodges that nearly to the end of the 1700s never adopted the third degree. And it wasn't practised by those old Scottish lodges? Okay. No, because they, in their mind, the story of the third degree is just a heresy. Yes, okay. Good fellow crafts would never slay their masters. They would never have got to that point where they were fellow crafts. No, yeah, okay. no. Yep. and that, to them that was just... And Bob Cooper, brother Bob Cooper, the um, uh, librarian at Grand Lodge of Scotland, or actually I think he might be the curator, made that very point that Scottish masons of the time would have gone... This is just madness. Yeah, yeah. Madness. <laughs> so we're sort of, sort, of, sort of getting an idea of some of the tensions that must have arose yeah, when the unification um, happened. Yeah. And, and we know, and uh, you mentioned in here, um, the tension that's going on between various lodges because this new lodge has come along, claim themselves a grand lodge, claim themselves to have authority to do all this, so you can kind of see where the old stonemason's lodges would have gone. What the? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you guys doing? Yeah. Which for our listeners is interesting. Uh, Brendan will elaborate a little bit more, but basically what happened is you had a you had a couple of, or well, many Masonic traditions, and they all sort of it came to a head um, in, in the late sort of 1700s, early 1800s. It wasn't it where they had the unification of the United Grand Lodge of England. Um, but from what I understand, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I got told that in Scotland uh, there's a different culture around Grand Lodge uh, in terms of the way it works, in terms of the Scottish. Lodges are independent, they maintain their independent ritual because their traditions go back for a very, very long time. Um, it's, there's a bit of a difference between Scotland and England, isn't there, in terms of the tradition? Uh, in, in most grand lodges around the world, because Scotland, as you say, has that unique history. The lodges were there hundreds of years before the Grand yeah, Lodge. Yeah. So the Grand Lodge, so here, if our Grand Lodge sends out an edict that says, Lodges, this is what you now must comply with, in Scotland, they'll send out a suggestion that possibly the lodge might like to consider that might be a good idea okay, okay. for you to follow <laughs> yes, a, purely as a, a suggestion. suggestion. We're not infringing on your no, sovereignty. No, no. Yes, okay. And, and, it's that, and the, the Scots are very fierce in maintaining that independence. Yeah. And from what I understand, some of the Scottish ritual is some of the oldest and the best ritual, uh, at, least, at least from what I understand in terms of the practices. And I know that um, the, the English sort of constitution, obviously when it spread around the colonies, uh, around and Australia being a good example of that, took that model of top-down imposition um, and, and, and we've adopted it obviously here in Victoria and I know a lot of states, the United States have a similar approach as well. Um, if we digress just slightly, we have that instance in the late 1700s where in England they passed those two acts, the Secret Society Act and I think the Oath Act or something. Um, and that was against then Irish secret societies, Jacobite secret societies and the beginnings of trade unions. Yes. Getting workers together that don't want that sort of thing yes. happening. Yep. So it was a ban on societies getting together. And because of the way it was framed, that was going to cover Freemasonry. Oh, okay. We were going to be caught in that net and become illegal. Yes, yes. But at that time, we had royalty as our <laughs> grand masters. They went and talked to the prime minister and got a little exemption put in for Freemasons. So it's always good to have them on site. But from that point on, and this is the point, we became very much part of the establishment yes. in, in an English yes. context. Yes. So as the empire spreads around the world, Freemasonry is part of that establishment structure. It's spreading right at the forefront. So that you get the instance here where Adelaide, Adelaide was the first city formed by free settlers. Yep. So it was all pre-planned, all pre-packaged before they arrived. And in amongst that pre-planning and pre-packaging was a lodge. Oh, OK. That yep. was founded in London already. So when they arrive here in Adelaide, you know, they've got all the set up. All the crucial members of this new colony are members of the lodge. So basically what you're saying is that Freemasonry, because of its attachment to establishment institutions, became an institutional structure yes, of, very much of, so. of the cultural practices of very the time. Much so. so you had obviously schools and governments and then Freemasonry. This is a very interesting perspective. Um, and look, at that time, as soon as like a new colony in the empire was started, and you're going to start building public buildings, you got the Freemasons to parade down the street 
and lay the foundation stone. Yeah, yeah. So we were very much at the forefront of building empire. You, just without digressing too much, do you, do you think that that's because there was a view that being a Freemason was essential to promoting good uh, uh, civic practices or moral practices, or was it just a tradition that got embedded in all that? A bit of both. A bit of both? Uh, probably a bit of your own, because if you're a, say, a civil servant or a businessman moving around the empire... If you're a Freemason, it's so much easier because yeah. wherever you're going to lodge, there's a lodge. As soon as you get there, the people in the lodge are the people you need to know. And they're all treating you like yeah. a brother, obviously. So. Yeah, because you're Protestant, you're white, you're English. And you're, you're travelling around. Okay. Yeah. That's very interesting. Um, and that's sort of, it's, it's good for our listeners to know that that sets up the sort of the contextual uh, context which sets out how this third degree came about and, you know, what sort of influences may have set this degree about on, on, in terms of the craft. And from what you've said, just to correct me if I'm wrong, is it looks like it's come about a number of ways, but one of the more compelling arguments is it's come through through maybe an imposition for a grand body after a, a bunch of different factions have come together and agreed to impose this, or not impose it, but sort of in, instructed on, on lodges. Is that correct? Um, yeah, we're not 100% sure why they did it. Why they did it, yeah, that's the question. That's Motive the is question. Yeah, um, yeah. We know that it appears, and from a record of an unofficial music club in the se- mid-1720s, they, to be a member of this music club, you had to be a Freemason. Okay. So they were initiating people into this club as Freemasons <laughs> so you could be a member, a member and club. you had to take a third degree as well. Oh, so you do all three. So yeah. there, you, there we have our first indication that it's, it's, an, un, it's an irregular lodge. It yeah, was a music yeah. club, but yeah, they yeah. were Masons. But they were also doing this Master Mason degree. Okay. So you kind of go, oh, okay, it's spreading. But why? But why? why? Why did they do it? Did they think, now that we've got royalties of our head... We need something more. Yeah, yeah. Maybe the two. Yeah, they thought the two degrees were two enough. wasn't enough. We yeah. need that extra bit <clears throat> to give it that oomph. Well, that's and you're right. I mean, and and the and well, what we'll do now is we'll start talking about maybe the specific themes that are coming out the degree. But in terms of the, well, let's deal with the basics first because we've been doing this for the other last two episodes. We've been talking specifically about the working tools. So um, your re- listeners will recall that in episode um, three we discussed. The trowel and how that's missing. We're not going to go over that again, but I'm just letting you know that if you want are interested in sort of missing working tools or missing concepts of the third degree, the trowel is one of them. Go back and listen to our episode on, on that. Um, if you're into missing working tools, go and see a Scottish third degree. Oh, okay. They anyway. do, yes, they're very passionate about that, I've noticed. And um, let, Let's talk about quickly about the working tools of the third degree. So you've got the compasses, the skirt and the pencil. Well, what do they represent in, in the, themselves? And what are they trying to tell us about the Master Mason's degree? Well, I think, I know you've already covered this, but we'll just go back to the other two degrees for a minute. Mm-hmm. The first degree are tools of preparation. You know, use your time wisely. Control your passions and prejudices. Educate your minds. Really basic stuff. So if you're coming in as a Freemason, here we say, here's some really basic precepts for you to follow. Master those and you're well on your way to being a Freemason. Second degree, we give you tools of a craftsman, you know, level conduct, upright intentions, that sort of stuff. So in a fashion, we're giving you a really simple system of morality to put on top of those basics we gave you before. So they build on each other. Mm -hmm. So on one, you've got the first degree deals kind of with the physical, your physical environment. The second degree is kind of in a fashion talking about the mental, in a fashion nature and science. So in the third degree, once you've got those two kind of in place and you've got an understanding of them, we move to the spiritual. Okay. So you've got to have your basis, your foundation first before you can think, okay, I can now move to a, a, a spiritual level. So basically what you're saying is that the, is it is a progressive science we're, we're in the sense that the tools are being used progressively to yes. improve distant elements of yes. who we are. And then you're saying now we're focusing on the purely spiritual element of our existence. Yes. Yeah. yes, so in the in the first two we've looked at the world around us, we've looked at ourselves, how we fit into that world, how science and nature kind of come together. 
And then in the third degree, we say, well, all right, there's another dimension as well. There's a spiritual dimension. Spiritual dimension. Interesting. Mm. Okay. And, or um, mystical, whatever you want mystical, to Mystical. And whatever. obviously, that, that's, that, that brings a lot of conjecture in terms of what is the spiritual sort of element we're talking about. Is it, is it, a, is it, is it an extension? Is, would it be fair to say that, because obviously in Freemasonry, you need to believe in a supreme being to be a member, I mean, at least in regular lodges. Um, in terms of the concept of this spirituality, one thing that was confronting for me, because I'm not particularly religious, um, but when it comes down to me uh, facing that third degree, I remember thinking about, um, I think it was, there's a charge about the emblems of mortality, about your mm. existence, your finite existence. And at one point they say, at, the, at this point you stand on the very brink of the grave. And I remember thinking at that point, geez, that's, that's an awakening experience. Um, uh, it is. And look, that's one of the things that sets Freemasonry apart from other organisations. Go and join Ratery and Apex. And they're not going to make you consider the mortality of your life. Exactly right. Um, it's only something that Freemasonry does. Which is sobering, I think. Uh, yeah, it's, it's something that it's probably missing slightly in society today, that, that reflection upon yourself. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, the, the, the fleeting moment of your life. We tend to think that we're, we're sort of immortal. We're yeah, until one day you get really old, sick and die. Exactly right. It doesn't right. occur to you until that happens. And it's sort of hushed under the carpet. And, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and so in terms of the spirituality, are we talking um, the beyond? Or are we talking about both. some... Both. We're talking both. about both. Okay. Both. All right. Uh, I, I think we are. Um, others may disagree. Yep. But I think on one level, yes, we're talking about physical death. But on another level, we're talking about a spiritual realm, yes. whatever your conception of that may be. I know I have some spiritualists in Lodge of Research, and I don't really see eye to eye with some of yes, their beliefs, because yes, yes, yes. they're really at the extreme end of, yes. of, of those beliefs. But that's the beauty of Freemasonry. We say there is no set creed. It's open to your own interpretation. Open to your own interpretation. All right, well, I mean, it's okay, that's very interesting. I'm sure we'll touch on some of that in more detail in a moment. But So the compass is, from what I recall, it's that basic principle of um, you know, knowing the, the, the point within a circle in which no one can err, that concept of you know, know where you stand, know where your limits are, all that practical significance. Um, would you agree with that, or is there more to expand on that? Um, no, the, the, I find the working tools for the third degree... Or, or actually, most of the working tools are fairly straightforward in the message they're getting yep. across. Okay, in that case, we'll just we'll go through them. And, and the skirt is obviously there to sort of lay lines and designs. And for our listeners, um, the idea of is it, it, we, we shape our ceremonies on the building of this temple. Uh, we're, we're not talking about a physical temple. We're talking about maybe something that's probably more internal, about building your character. It might be building your spirituality, whatever it is you want to improve on in your life. And the working tools in this degree are really about laying designs. You've, you've done, like you said, Brendan, you've done the work, you've built this structure, and now it's about looking at more of sort of, you're at that rank now where you're looking at laying designs and ordering the work, being an overseer of the work. So uh, yeah, these are more tools of design. Design, Whereas yes. before they were your, your basic tools, then your craftsman tools, now you've got the tools of Design. So presumably you've discovered some of the mis hidden mysteries of nature and science? Yeah, and, and as I say to guys, in, you know, when you're giving talks on this kind of stuff, it doesn't happen overnight. No. The fact that you have done the first degree ceremony doesn't mean you walk out the door of the lodge room understanding it all completely and it all makes sense. Yeah. It might take you years until you have that light bulb moment you go, Oh yeah, okay, I get it now, yeah. I get it. I think that was, James Tolk was saying that last week um, in terms of the perfect Ashley situation. He goes, I don't think I'm ever going to, I'm ever going to reach that point where I become a perfect Ashley. And the whole point of that was, it's a journey and there is, necess these are ideals that we aspire yes, to. Yes, I was yeah. just about to say, in yeah. some respects, they're ideals. Um, doesn't mean they're not attainable. Just means that it's a work in progress. Yes. Okay, and and obviously the pencil is, is is there for the purpose of sort of drawing and laying those designs. So as you said, Brendan, it's all pretty straightforward, and I think our listeners um, will probably be able to interpret that quite well. But I'll just pick you up on the point where you said um, the 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 tools and on the center, etc. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All of those working tools operate on a center pin. Yes. Okay. Yep. 
Um, so, so there's that, a common theme of being in yeah, the centre. So again, it comes back to, and this is something we haven't touched on, it's, it's very much in the second degree, the aspects of geometry. Mm -hmm. And you kind of think, what's geometry got to do with all of this? You know, how does it fit in? And you've got to remember that 300 years ago, um, Isaac Newton was the equivalent of a pop star. You know, his works were just idolised. And a lot of it revolved around geometry. And so you had this whole mindset while this third degree was being created that um, geometry, if you could understand geometry, you could unlock the works of, you know, the, the creator, yeah, God. Yeah. And I, I kind of think that's the reason why there's so much geometry kind of embedded in our ceremonies. And even today, when you think the um, DNA mapping or yeah. the genome, yeah. and you have a look at that, it's geometrical. Yes. So kind of what they're saying isn't that outdated. Yes. It's a kind of the discoveries we all make today have still got geometric aspects to them. I mean, from, my, from my understanding or interpretation of, of modern science at the very least, I, I know we're focusing more now on the cosmos than we are Earth, but the whole principle, and this is where the geometry element comes in, it's about we're trying to find that recipe, that, that idea, that theory that's going to be able to sum up our existence or the why things happen. And I well, think yeah, an explanation. In, in, for them, geometry was the explanation of understanding the works of God. And you're saying that's how it influenced uh, the degree. Yeah, and so that's why yeah. so much of it you'll find in our ceremonies. You kind of go, what are they talking about? <laughs> You know, the fourth part of a square and stuff. Yeah. What, what's yeah. the relevance? Where does it come from? Yeah. And, and I think that's where it's come from, the concept that you understand geometry and you're halfway there. Yeah, okay. Um, and I, there was a nice little bit I was reading the other day, a guy in the 1730s telling the brethren of his lodge, you should never pass a night without discussion on geometry and architecture. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so that's it's how, that sort of concept, yeah. Yeah, that's how they saw their lodge meeting. We're going to sit around and discuss geometry and architecture and that'll help us understand the world around well, us. That's very interesting. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. Okay, so that's, that's a good sort of, I think what we've set up the degree really well. We know some of the practical sort of elements. Now let's talk about some of the stuff that's sort of veiled in allegory, to use a term, mm -hmm. some of the stuff that's not so clear. Um, we've got a list of themes here that the, the, the degree covers, and there's probably more to that list as well, but let's try and go through them in turn and get an idea of what your perspective is there. So obviously deaf... There's a big part. So there's some people when you summarise the degree saying the first degree is about being born or enlightened, second degree is about your life, and third degree is about dying. Tell us a bit more about what your perception on that is. Um, yeah, I can, I've, I've, I've heard that argument many times. I think, yes, it makes sense. Your first degree is you know, your early years. The second degree is your adult life. And your third degree is your declining years till death. It's, it's a nice way of looking at it. Um, I... Not so sure that's how I look at it. I look at it more of you yourself. Mm -hmm. you Tell know, us more about that. You, you, you've taken your first degree. You're going to now build your character as a Freemason. Build up those basics that we give you where we say charity should your, be your basic foundation stone. And as I said, you then lay the second degree on that with all of the teachings of that. And then we reach the third degree where we say to you, now there's another level. There's a spiritual level. Um, and so that ceremony isn't just death. I mean, on one hand, we say, yes, contemplate your mortality, which is an important point, as we were saying earlier. For Freemasons, no other organisation makes you sit there and think, geez, I'm going to die, it's all going to end. Once you got over that, I think there's another level to it, saying, yes, there is more to this, though. So you're saying that uh, death is more of a conduit just yes. rather than the actual theme. Just I, I noticed that we in, during the ceremony, we, there's a lot of sort of funeral chimes and, and hymns and, and that sort of stuff. And I think you are right uh, in the sense that we can oversimplify the degrees yeah. in that respect. Well, that's the, the kind of simple level explanation of it. Yes, it, it is about death. Yes. But it's more than that. Yeah. Otherwise, we're a freaking death cult. <laughs> okay, yes. The, the, the eclipse of our degrees focuses on death. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, the, it, it, there's more to it than just saying, yeah, and at the end of your life, you're going to die. Yeah. I don't think they went to all that trouble just to tell you you're going to tell you yes. gonna die. Okay. So for, for you, death in the third degree is a conduit towards... A broader discussion on mm. the themes of spirituality and what, yes. what happens after death. Yes. So that's the concept. Okay. Uh, and for each of us, that's going to be a different concept. Yes. Really. 
what is death? Yeah, yeah depending and, and, on your and creed. Your, yeah, yeah, and depending on your creed, whether it's there's an afterlife or bodily resurrection, that kind of stuff. I was just reading the other day that in some of the American lodges, um, what was the term they used? Um, replacement theology. Okay. The, the third degree is ramming home the fact that Christianity is now the superior religion. Oh, okay. Okay, interesting. And that's why it was developed, to say that Christianity now reigns supreme. And it, I it, thought, it, oh, okay, I've never looked at it that, that way. But there are some, there are some parallels, um, at least in my interpretation, between the story of Hiram Abiff and uh, Christ, at least. I can see there's a parallel between the two. Yeah, I noticed that in your notes, and I thought, and probably a lot of people see that and I've even been to a map explanation where the presenter said to this group of young guys it's about the resurrection of Jesus Christ yes. I'm thinking, no it's freaking not yeah 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 uh, because the guys that developed this several of them were church ministers yes so you're talking 1720s yes you think they would come up with something that was based on the death and resurrection of Jesus that would be blasphemy <laughs> Maybe we can get into that because I'll, I'll, I'll share. Some, maybe we can have a bit of a discussion about it because I'll share some different views. But let's let's um, <clears throat> let's have a quick chat about. Um, so we've mentioned death, and we've mentioned there's more than death. One thing I want to touch on, which I think there's a lot of conjecture over, is you enter the first degree blindfolded, so you you approach that in darkness. Then you you brought to light, which we've named this podcast after that concept of being brought to light. Mm-hmm. In the third degree, you enter, but you're in a different sort of state of darkness. And one thing I want to discuss with you is that in that in the degree, there is a light. Uh, it shines in the east. There's a lot of discussion about what is that light. Uh, there's practical ideas of it being. I think someone told me that it was the sun rising in the east, which I thought was a bit bit of a, a bland ex- explanation. I've heard others say that it's Venus, Venus, yes. which is which seems sort of in touch with maybe some of the um, sort of traditional. Astronomy. That whole thing about Solomon and the divine, is it Shekinah? Yeah, which yep, is I've Venus, heard right, exactly yes. right. And, and I just want to get your take on that because I don't think the light in the east is there by accident. I think it is significant. I have a particular view on it, which I'll put to you and then you can sort of maybe... I'll, I'll give you the historical view. You give me the historical view. All right, beautiful. Go for it. Um, and that whole concept of darkness visible comes from Milton's poem from 17, 1667. Um, his epic poem, Paradise Lost. And what it's describing is when Satan and his followers are thrown out of heaven. Do you want me to just quote it? Yeah, quote it, quote it. Yep. Um, a dungeon horrible on all sides around, one great furnace flamed, yet from those flames no light but rather darkness visible, served only to discover the side of woe, regions of sorrow, doleful shades, where peace and rest can never dwell. Hope never comes. That comes to all but torture without end. And it goes on. And it yeah, yeah. So, uh, and this is a guy from Lodger Research, did a little paper on this a few years ago. He said that educated gentlemen of the 1700s, as soon as they heard that phrase, would know exactly where it came from, exactly the context of it, and exactly what it meant. Okay. It's just that we're so divorced now from Milton's Paradise Lost. When someone says darkness visible, we go, what the? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What the hell are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. But to those guys then, there was no question. They, they knew it. exactly what people were talking about because it was current pop culture. Yes, yes. So yes. when they said darkness visible, they immediately thought Milton's Paradise Lost, the devil being thrown into hell. Okay. So you're saying that's the historical context the of it. historical context yep. of it. So how do we interpret that today? Is it, you know, this is what will happen to the um, unworthy man yeah, yep, in a yep, fashion? Yep. Or do we see it more as that light at the end of the tunnel? Yes, that, that seems to be my view on that. Um, you sort of think about life beyond beyond death and obviously the, the the chapter degree tries to build on this our concept of veils and passing through a different you know more ta- or different existence sorry and um i tend to look at the light in the east as a, the light at the end of the tunnel you know that you, you're passing through that stage of death you're, metal- you're coming to an end and there's that light uh, to Others call you may home say it's your divine spark oh yes okay yeah i can see that yeah. um yeah. you know that's that's your divine spark that is in within you yes um so we're you know reminding you of your mortality 
And here's that divine spark. Yes, waiting to be ignited. Yeah, mm. okay. That's very interesting. Uh, that's, and, and so basically, um, which I think is, is sort of inherent in, in all the degrees, especially this one, is the contextual uh, times in which it was created. There's obviously, like you said, certain pop culture or elements that at the time would have been mm. so obvious. But what I, what I think is great about our system of degrees and what is going to continue to allow it to be relevant is this developing concept of interpretation and I think that that's really important uh, yeah to, we shouldn't shut our Freemasonry down and ossify it mm. and say this mm. is it never to be changed yep. never to be touched because it has changed it has evolved yes. what Freemasonry was in the 1700s was different to what it was in the 1800s yes. the 1900s and what it must be again different in this century or well, even even the last 50 years hasn't it sort of changed dramatically in some uh, i'd say during the 1900s that was an evolutionary change yeah. here in victoria we had after the first world war a hundred percent increase in membership and lodge numbers well yeah a hundred percent that was greater it. than after the second world war yes yeah so that was our first huge influx of people and i think that's when freemasonry here became open to everyone yes 1800s, it was very exclusive. So it was a, sort of a, an aristocratic organisation. Well, for a start, you would have had to be English. Yep. You would have had to be Protestant. Yes. You would have had to be fairly wealthy because the Jews and fees were kept deliberately high, primarily to keep the Irish out. Yes, okay. It stopped the sort of... Those, the riffraff. Those riffraff. My <laughs> ancestors getting <laughs> in the door. <laughs> How did I sneak in? Look, you, you've, you've broken the, you've broken the mould there. Congratulations. I mean... Um, <laughs> Uh, I know my family are all from Malta, so I know over there it's a whole different story. They're still a secret society in the sense they're scared to put up their emblems and symbols because they're scared of the Catholic Church obviously having Yeah, a slight digression in that European Freemasonry is a bit like that because remember they had to start afresh yes. 50 years ago because uh, they got wiped out. They got wiped, absolutely wiped out. So yeah. now they're a lot more reticent about sticking a flashing <laughs> neon sign out the front and say, hi, this is where the Masons Lodge is because yeah. yeah. we remember what happened 50 years ago. Exactly right. They're, it's still fresh in their memories. You it? sent us off to concentration camps and burnt our lodges down. Yes. So in that case, we'll just meet and do our thing. Very quietly. Very quietly. Okay. All right. And um, another um, couple of other themes that I want, sort of want to touch on. And um, I think this is a, sort of an obvious one, isn't it? The concept of betrayal. And I, you touched on it earlier in the sense of how some people would view this whole concept of betrayal being ridiculous because in order to become a fellow craft Freemason... You meant you at that point. You meant to be trusted, and that was the highest degree you could go before you become a master. So it was obviously very important. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about this concept of betrayal, and maybe you can talk about the, the sort of the play that we act in the degree without ruining anything, of course, and maybe some of the actors and where that comes from. Um, well, the concept of betrayal to me is that um, the person in the drama. Uh, who we say was the builder of King Solomon's temple, um, is betrayed by people within his own circle. So it's people close to him. Um, so in a fashion, we can kind of apply that to ourselves in that we shouldn't get knocked down by things within our own circle, such as passions, envy, malice, those kinds of things. They can be the ruffians that knock us down, that knock us off and being good fellow crafts. Um, that's how I see those idea of the ruffians. But as you said, um, they actually have names in other jurisdictions. In America, they actually gave them names. Um, it's come from the old English traditions, but the English never gave the names to these three ruffians. But in an American context, they actually do give them names. I don't think I want to go into the area yeah, of what yeah, those yeah. names There's a could... whole debate about that, yeah, isn't there? Yes, I, yeah. I think it's possibly would be here all day if we started going down that path. But yeah, the concept of those ruffians are within your own circle of acquaintance, your, your own sphere of influence. And the idea is just to sort of maintain, monitor and be aware of those things. Yeah. And, and look, before you were saying, where did it come from? Um, what did they use as the template? Um, and I think you can't go too far past the old mystery schools, mm. you know, Dionysius, Mithra, Adonis, there's a whole series of them. 
that the Aleutian mysteries that revolved around that whole concept of after the end of the ceremony you are a new man, you, you know, you're, you've a new life as this new man, I think they use that as their template. Okay. And a lot of those old mystery stools revolve like the Osiris um, Egyptian one, revolves around the cycle of life, yep. the changing seasons. You know, for six months of the year, the sun disappears and comes back yes, again. Yes, changing the constellations. All so that. let's just imagine that um, winter is knocked down by the three ruffians of autumn yes. and is brought back again by the three brothers of spring. So in a fashion, it's, it's replicating that concept of the cycle of life. Yes, yes. The seasons, all of those kinds of things, which would have been a lot more relevant to agrarian societies a long yes, time absolutely. ago. Yes, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think they use that as a template because these guys who devised all this were educated men. Yes, they are borrowing from some of the best traditions at the time. And I think that's what they did. That's where they got that template. I'm not so sure they used Jesus Christ as the template. I'm not so sure on that. Yeah, I know you want to get to that. I know you want to get to that. No, no, I don't don't know if I do. Um, I'm just thinking that at the time, I think if they did, that would have been construed as blasphemy. Mm. Because England at that time was still rife with um, religious disputes, depending on who the the king was at the time. You could have your head chopped off for your religious beliefs. Mm, yeah. So I don't think they would have made a Master Mason's degree based on an allegory of Jesus Christ. It, it, it's possible, but I don't know if it would have been overt. Okay, well, let, let's let's discuss that. So basically, so our listeners are aware, one of the things that I did before we put this interview together was I had a look at some research and looking at some of the f- suggestions, more outlandish stuff, I wanted to find something controversial for Brendan because I know Brendan is very passionate about this sort of discussion. So I'm going to play devil's advocate. Um, one of the themes of the third degree, and I think we can agree on this, is resurrection, the concept of resurrection or rebirth or re-enlightenment these sort of concepts mm. of i think it's i think it's an element is it, i think the word resurrection is used probably five five or six times during the degree um one of the one of the contentions we're raised and it's called a raising so mm. i think consider yeah, that word resurrection is actually used. well yeah the sorry raising would probably indicate resurrection would you would you agree not necessarily well okay well I'll, I'll put it to you that it does mean that and the concept is that um I think, obviously, in a number of traditional religions, the idea is that at a certain point in time, um, our spirits are going to be, in some believe, the body, which is which is another story in itself, but a spirit or body is going to be raised from below, and this concept of resurrection, uh, you know, God or the, you know, the Almighty bringing us back to a point of resurrection, mm. immortality, um, that concept, to clearly have based the allegory on Jesus Christ would be very risky. But you did mention before that at the time there was. Uh, uh, look, I, yeah, I agree. I think it's a, possibly an underlying yeah. theme where they're saying, you know, resurrection, Christianity rules, you know, yes. stuff you. Yes. We're now, we're now the, yeah. the king shit in town. Um, and I, I have a feeling there's a bit of that in there. Uh, there's some that argue they created the third degrees to make Jewish brothers Christian. Yeah, okay, okay, yep. Yep. Um, I don't know if our Jewish brothers would agree with that. Yes, I, I understand. <laughs> I think I understand. they'd probably find that quite offensive. Yes, yeah, but there's a, that's a contention. That's been, yeah, yep, yep. it's a contention that's yep. been suggested. Um, but I, I tend to think, yes, there's an element. Remembering there's ministers in amongst yep. the guys developing but, that. Yeah. Well, what better way to um, what better way to sort of sub subliminally sort of impose your or get your beliefs in the minds of people than to. Yeah. In corp- I'm not saying that they didn't borrow from other schools because Christianity itself has borrowed from a number of other traditions, right? Pagan traditions, as they'd call them, um, where this concept of a messiah or a you know, resurrecting sort of martyr is is a big theme of those religions. I, all I'm contending, playing devil's advocate, is that perhaps we've done the same thing because one thing I find very interesting about Jesus Christ and uh, Hiram Abiff, that parallel, is that Jesus um, obviously... Uh, you know, the concept is that Jesus died on the cross for the purpose of absolving us of our sins, the idea of atonement, you know, that concept of... Whereas I think the parallel with Hiram Abiff that was suggested in the article I was reading was that the idea is that he died not revealing 
the ob- not not revealing the secrets. You know, he was true to his name, a true martyr. I think there's a, there is a parallel there, but there's also parallels with other gods mm. and other religions as well. Um, what's your view on that? I'd love to get your take on this concept of a subliminal, sort of a, sub, a, a, a subconscious imposition of Christianity into this degree. Well, I think yes, as we're saying, there is a deliberate uh, imposition of an element of Christianity in that yeah. degree, martyrism. and well, not just martyrism, the concept of Christianity resurrection. Yes. Um, you know, by God's revealed will, mm. we're now not going to be forever just. Um, decaying matter in the ground he's now given us eternal afterlife and I have a feeling that's what that is framed at so they've taken elements of the mystery school that whole concept of the changing of seasons and that but they've also said we've now perfected religion yes there's now an afterlife through Christianity okay and, and uh, you know and to I, I often wonder how does someone from a non-Christian background perceive all that because remember, they don't have all of that, you know, uh, inculcated Christian background. Yeah. So when they look at that, do they see? They don't even see that level because they don't comprehend it in that way. Yeah. Well, speaking as someone who hasn't practiced religion in that in that way, uh, that it drew alarm bells for me when I saw. You that. actually thought it was. I, I I thought that was a diff- significant influence at the very least, because one thing I've noticed is that we don't just talk about Hiram Abiff as a figure. We, we revere him. I'm not going to say worship, but we very much revere this person. And the legend, I believe, is, is, is sort of conveyed in such a way that it almost draws that parallel, you know, that, mm. that ideal, that, that martyr, that sacrifice, you know, what a true man, you know, that sort of... And it goes beyond a simple man doing a good deed. It's mm. almost godly, if I can say it without offending anyone. And that, I guess when I was going through the degree, I felt that, and I'm not religious, and I wouldn't say I was a Christian either, but I definitely felt that. Um, and I just I thought it'd be interesting to throw that at you and see what you thought. Yeah. Um, I must admit, just reflecting on mine, I thought this is an interesting concept, mm. you know. Here I am contemplating my mortal existence. But there were elements where I thought, that's decidedly Christian. I yes. thought this order was supposed to be non-sectarian. Yes. yes. Whereas the other degrees... Completely different. Yeah, they are. They're non-sectarian. Yeah. And suddenly this year you go, hang on a sec, if, if you guys are meant to have taken the Christian elements out of this, there's an awful lot you've <laughs> left in <laughs> here. Left quite a bit out. Exactly right. Yeah. Um, there's even a phrase they use at the, the, you know, the very point of the, the highlight of the degree, and it's something of, you know, through him, with him, in him, yes. you shall live forever. Exactly right. That's Christianity. Exactly right. Why is it still in there if we're universal? Exactly right. Which is, which is, which is, I guess, it's going to the whole point of what I'm trying to say is that um, this is why the third degree is different. I mean, I could see the third degree being at home in another appendic order. I could see that, right? Um, but in terms of the craft itself, I find it to be particularly out there. Mm. Well, I... I tend to think it supports the idea that those guys who put it together were Christian. Yes. They put that element in there because, you know, Christianity is now the superior religion. Yes. There was, there was no doubt in their mind. It wasn't as if they were being, you know, derogatory to other religions or anything. They just knew that that was self-evident. Yeah, it was, it was a if self-evident truth. Exactly. Yeah, if you didn't know that self-evident truth, well, jeez, you're a bit mad. Um, I'll just pick up on a, a yep. point you raised mm-hmm. there about where did it come from? Now, there's an interesting group you mentioned other orders. There's a group called Operative Freemasons. Now, that pretty much started in the early 1900s by a guy called Stretton and his offsider Carr. And cutting a long story short, he basically said I got initiated into the operatives while I was at um, first year university doing my engineering degree, and I stuck with it. And he said the ceremonies are completely different to Freemasonry. And his argument is that some of those guys that formed the Grand Lodge of London, such as Anderson and Desigulier, joined the operative lodge of St Paul's Churchyard in the early 1700s and got kicked out for making other Masons without their approval. And his argument is they got kicked out before they had the full knowledge of where this ceremony sits. Oh, so you're saying they'd remained. It would have made and he good. said that that is not one of the seven degrees of the operative Masons. It is one of their annual ceremonies that is used 
to replace one of their three grand masters annually. Ah, so they've borrowed from that tradition. Okay. So yeah. he argued that they took a bit of lodge ceremony that wasn't a degree and took it out of context. And turned it into a degree. And turned it into a degree. Very interesting. But a lot of his stuff you have to take with a grain oh, of salt. Of so I don't know... How that sort of tunes in with reality, exactly. Right. Yeah, but it's an interesting concept that they got it wrong. Yeah, that, yeah. That they took an idea and got it wrong. Well, that's, that's the interesting part about it. And it's good that we've sort of touched on this. And if our listeners have any ideas, I'm sure Brendan Kine would love to hear them as well. We'd send them through uh, to um, contact at blue.fmvic.com. We'd love to hear your views about what your view about how this degree was influenced and some of your takes on maybe when you're going through it, what your experiences were. I mean, that was just my view at least. Sort of building on this concept, um, one thing that's sort of reoccurring, which we'd be remiss not to touch, is the five points of fellowship. Now, you are when you are raised on the five points of fellowship, which I thought was very peculiar, to be honest with you, um, when I was going through it. Um, can you give us just sort of a quick rundown of what you believe they are, and if you believe they're significant, or if you think that's sort of been an attack on to sort of teach some principles? Well, whether or not it's an attack on, I actually think it's a nice embodiment of what it means to be a Freemason and how you treat a brother. Five simple steps on the way you should treat a fellow Mason. And I think they're quite nice, actually. Whether or not they're an addition to it, um, here's one for you. Possibly they're not, because it's been suggested that what that is, I don't know how relevant this is, that comes from the operative Masons that if you're on a building site and one of your fellow masons has fallen off the scaffolding, you don't just run and pick him up off the ground because, as we know, if someone's fallen off a building site, you don't just pick them up because that could cause more damage. Yes, than yes. What. Yeah. So here you have three people. So it's almost like an Ockhoff health and safety yeah, thing. Okay, okay. Three people are involved and you have to lift the brother off the ground in a certain way to take him to what we would call the first aid centre. Very or what. interesting. So you're saying that the operatives had this practice of assisting people in, in need who had hurt themselves at yeah, work. so if you're falling off the school, hit the ground, you don't just run up and pick this guy yeah. up willy-nilly. There's a OHS and s way to do it, and yeah. that's it. Three guys are needed, and they support the guy and lift him up. Are you kind of think? Oh, yeah, so he ends up across your shoulder so with the other lifting two. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. that he's got no weight on any of those vital organs that may have been damaged. Very interesting. I've, no, I've never think, heard that before. It's interesting. I wonder, and I mentioned that to a, a, a um, couple of medical people I know who are Masons, and they said, well, being nurses, they said, yes, that's kind of how we're taught to lift people out of a bed. Very interesting. So you're saying that we've got OHS and uh, medieval OHS and spirituality all, <laughs> and, uh, all rolled into one. Mix them together. Yes. That's fantastic. That's very very good. Oh, that's that's a, that's blown, blown my mind. And so there you go. I'll be you, successful. You've, you've done well today. Um, so the operatives obviously have more of an influence on this than what I even anticipated. I've heard of the operatives. I know that the degrees are apparently a lot of fun. Uh, now, look, when I say the op, I'm not talking about... The current operatives. You're talking the current, about I'm talking about the actual the, operatives. Uh, actual actual op operatives. Back uh, in the old... Okay, yes. just want to clarify. There is a system of degrees called the operatives, which I heard are a lot of fun, but that's interesting. And it does make sense we're borrowing from those operative degrees because that's where, technically, the idea of pre-masonry is so supposed to have come from. A uh, and look, just to muddy the waters further, there's a thing called the Graham Manuscript. I think it dates from around 1720. It has a lot of the Masonic ritual you would know as familiar, but it also includes the three sons of Noah going to Noah's grave, lifting yes. the body of Noah out to look for lost secrets. Yeah, this, this, is, this is something we can talk on about. So you're saying, the th I've heard this contention before that the third degree borrows a lot of the Noachitic legend, that concept of um, the three sons resurrecting their father yeah. and trying to find hidden secrets and mm. observing so, signs. And so that was what I was saying at the start. Is there older material they base this on? We don't know. Yes. But th there is that one other manuscript that mentions a totally different person. And you kind of wonder, well, did they just update old material? Wouldn't surprise me. Yep. Or at the time, were there several people trying to create... Uh, and they're chucking um, all their influences. Yeah. yeah, and someone's going, no, no, that one doesn't work. What <laughs> yeah. do you got? Yeah. Hey, that one sounds good. We'll go with that one. Well, it's funny you mention that, and um, I'm not sure if you've done the, the Royal Ark Mariner degree, but in that degree there is a grip to help someone 
bring them up onto the ark. And it's a similar concept. And I remember when I went through it, I was like, oh, that reminds me, you know, the third degree, these grips, you know, it's not just a handshake, it's something different. You know, it's about lifting, physically doing something. So there is a parallel, I believe, and I think that the re- there's a lot of people have done research on this. I'd love to read more about this um, influence. of the. But basically, just to sort of, we've muddied the waters in the sense, but just to sort of get the umbrella correct, what you're saying is that, Basically, this degree was created in a period where there was a lot of cultural influences Mm -hmm. and a lot of heads around a table. Maybe the committee was a bit bigger than it should have been. And a a lot of people throwing their ideas in. Quite possibly. Um, And look, we know that they they were influenced by Milton's Paradise Lost, probably the old mystery schools. They definitely believed Christianity was the superior religion. And they were all biblically literate, so they're probably scratching around through biblical stuff to find the right story to fit the message they wanted to get across. Yes, yes. And someone in one particular Bible, the spelling is only in one particular Bible, I think it's Coverdale or something from the 1540s or something, spelt in exactly the same way. Okay. So it's quite possible this committee sitting around and one of them has a copy of that Bible and said, why don't we use this guy here who supposedly was the <laughs> engineer at building the temple? Yes, yes. yes. And you could kind of see how it might evolve. Yeah, that works. Because yes. Hiram Abiff isn't mentioned in the biblical text, uh, is that correct? Well, it's Hiram, no, King of Ty. No, no, there is a Hiram is that, Abiff okay. in, in that particular I think version, yep, yep. version yep. and it is spelt the same way we spell it, but only in that version. But in traditional, like the King James Bible wouldn't have Hiram Abiff in there. It does. It does, does. Okay, it, it does. does. All right. it, it does, but slightly different spelling. And it talks about he was good with um, brass work, okay. dyeing silks and materials. So that's where they got their, that, that sort of concept. Or and so it doesn't mention that he's very good at actual... Stonework. Stonework. <laughs> that's, we've just put him in that trade. Yeah, right? no, he was a yeah. craftsman. He was, you know, he fits in that. He's a smart guy. That's very interesting. Okay, um, well, it looks like we've covered quite a bit. I'm going to skip over some of the topics we've got here because we're basically, we're going to talk about things like the acacia and emblems of mortality and we can still talk about them if you want Brendan but I think we did cover this concept of the immortality of the soul what if we just stop at those emblems of mortality for a minute yeah let's, they, let's talk about those they yeah. again make you reflect on your mortal existence you know and they say to you again in that use your allotted time wisely 24 inch gauge um, continue to learn and use your intellectual faculties chisel the stain of falsehood and dishonour. There's your common gavel. Yeah. So we've gone back to those basics again. Have you got those basics correct? So it's reminding you to remember the foundations. Yeah, remember those foundations. Otherwise, this will be you. Yes, you, you end up in a situation. So we're just going briefly back to those very foundations at the start of your journey and say, have you got those right? Because this is inevitable. Yes. You're so not make going sure to avoid this. It's not something where yes. you sign up for death. Yes. It comes yes. knocking. So make sure so you do the right go thing. back to those fundamentals yeah. and get them right. That's, that's very interesting. I, I remember that particular element of the third degree was quite surprising uh, for a lot of reasons. But um, it, it, it's sort of, you know, they, at one point they, they put it, the, the brother doing the charge will put his hand on you and say, remember, you know, these emblems you know, within, you know, you are a mortal soul. And that's, like you he, said... He says, because I like You've got this, the line, beautiful. Contemplate yeah. your inevitable destiny and guide your reflections to that most interesting of all human studies, the knowledge of yourself. Yes, which is an important lesson. Because Socrates said, know thyself and you shall know the world and the gods. Exactly right. Socrates did say that. And that's, that's an important lesson, I believe. I mean, even from a practical perspective, moving away from this sort of symbolic... Uh, meaning of this degree knowing yourself knowing what does that mean that's that's an important thing do we ever know ourselves or do others know us better than ourselves that sort of concept but the idea of practically spending time to get to know who you are embodies freemasonry at least for me it's my chance once a month to go away and put my phone in the in the locker and think about where i am in this universe we're speculative masons we are speculative yes We, we speculate upon ourselves who we are and our existence within the world. Yes. And do we have a positive impact in the world around us or are we a negative impact? Yes, or or a neutral, zero impact, yes. In theory, as Freemasons, we should be a positive impact. Yes, an active force of good, yes. And that's kind of what we all 
kind of strive for. Yes. Some of us fail miserably, <laughs> <laughs> others not so. But it, it, and as you said, it's a journey. You know, some days I might fail miserably at that task. Other days I might excel and think, yes, I've had a positive contribution today. Yeah, and for our listeners who aren't Freemasons, I guess that's a good example of why the organisation is good to join or the fraternities are good to be part of because you have this capacity to allocate time in your month or week or whatever it is to think about what sort of uh, what makes you 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 know what sort of character do you want to be how can you improve your character these sort of i think in the busy society where everything sort of go 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 you don't really have that time for self reflection i think that's really important i found at least going to um, my grandparents when i used to go to church with them and the rest when i was a kid it was more of a focus on contemplating your relationship with god and the idea of what's going to happen when you die and this you know you must do this in order to result in you know afterlife whereas freemasonry doesn't do that it's all about you're here now you, we've got a finite existence. You may, you may have something after death. You know, that's up to you to figure out. But what are you going to do to improve your character? And the world around and you. The world around you, which I think is really useful. It is. I mean, the world would be a better place if we all took that approach to life. Yes. Yeah. Um, I agree, 100%. Okay. Um, well, thank you for pulling me up on the emblems of mortality. It's good that we didn't skip over them. Um, one thing... I sort of wanted to touch on as well, maybe because it's a bit self-serving because I'm a bit of a um, fan of the chapter and we want to do a episode probably in six months or so about the chapter. Um, we talk a little bit about, in this degree, genuine secrets. And I think the, uh, the idea is the genuine secrets are lost until time and circumstance should adjoin, in, restore the original. Now, for people out there who think about Freemasons, think, aren't you guys all about secrets? Well, look, that's another topic for another time. But... Um, let me get your view on this idea of gen- the genuine secrets of a master mason being lost. And you do all these three degrees and you realise, well, they're gone. What, what was the point of doing that? What is the point of doing that exercise? What does that mean? I think it was very much, again, the mindset of the period. Late 1600s into the 1700s, there was this whole view that the ancient civilizations had knowledge which was now lost. The ancient civilizations had learning that was now lost. And a very prevalent view in amongst all the religious struggles that were going on in England in the 1600s was the concept that there was also the pristine religion that God gave to Adam, yes. which is also lost. Yes. Yes. So there's this whole concept of things lost. The ancients had all this knowledge which we've now lost. So someone like Isaac Newton, who we know as you know, the founder of modern science and calculus, all of this kind of stuff, and we don't really think that he would have spent years working out, and he's not a Freemason, working out the measurements of King Solomon's temple so that he could arrive at what was the original God's cubit that mm. he gave to Adam. And he actually did come to a conclusion. And oh, he, did. he believed, if I've got it somewhere at my fingertips here, he actually came up. Ah, here we go. Um, after studying King Solomon's temple, he reached the conclusion that um, the sacred cubit given to the ancients by God was between 24 and a fifth <laughs> and 26 and a quarter Roman inches. Wow. So and how much he, time was he spending on that? Yeah, years. That's, that's a lot. Absolute years. Instead of doing other scientific research. He was well, the, most of his scientific research was done by the early years of his life. Yeah, yeah. He then devoted the entire rest of his life to alchemy. Alchemy, yes. Which is obviously part of that uh, Rosicrucian practice, isn't it? Yeah. He used the dimensions of King Solomon's temple once he'd worked out the sacred cubit to make prophecies for the future. Oh, okay. So this is the father of modern science. Yes, yes, yes. It's yes. a totally different man. Yeah, and that's the thing. I think history brushes over the sort of complex spiritual well, sort of sides to these, some of these well, early... Well, a lot of this stuff on Isaac Newton, they put in boxes and put away. Yeah, yeah. Because it wasn't the image they wanted to project. No, they want Here's this, sort this of complete nutcase <laughs> just doing all this weird stuff. Yeah, no, yeah. let's put all that. He's a scientist. Yes. He was a man of science. He didn't do all that wacky stuff. Some of stuff. the smartest people are the wackiest, though, aren't yes. they? I mean, and and that's, a, that's a good question I want to ask you. I don't know if it really relates to the third degree. Well, just before we move on, yeah, I'll get yeah. that bit of lost knowledge. Yes. Because um, Freemasons joined Freemasonry in the 1700s thinking that they would find the secrets of the ancients. Yes. That William Stuckley, now he was a, an antiquarian archaeologist, he was the first guy to go and excavate Stonehenge. 
and he says, quite blatantly in his diary, when he joined in 1722 or whatever, I joined Freemasonry looking for the secrets of the lost civilizations because he knew that would help in his discoveries. I don't know how disappointed or not <laughs> he was in that, but it was a real belief that Freemasonry contained these lost elements. And if you look around, you can rediscover yes, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So it would have had an exciting element to the time. Become a Freemason and you get, you know, all the ancients that's missing. Yes. So you, you had this concept at the time where people actually thought Freemasonry was the religion given to Adam. Oh, okay, yes. So yes. it had a whole new dimension for them. Yes, of course. That would, have, that would take on a whole different significance, especially from a practical perspective. And look, if you at the time believed, and as people did, the Bible was a historical text, then your Freemasonry takes a whole different yes. approach to your life if you believe that the Bible is a historical text. It's less allegory and more sort of reality, I yeah, suppose. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it all fits in beautifully. It works. It happened. Uh, there was a temple. And, and as, as, as sort of historical conjecture has sort of challenged a bit of that. Uh, the question I, was, uh, I want to ask is sort of fits in with this concept of genuine secrets and them being lost. One thing that I've sort of noticed about our traditions, and a lot of traditions, even, you know, you name the religion, uh, in Christianity we use as an example the concept of the, this small tribe of uh, Jewish people, Jews in, in, in Israel or the Middle East, happen to find, stumble upon this very fundamental relationship with the, the, the Creator, this concept that all knowledge rests in the past, which I think in today's sort of scientific culture i think we've obviously moved away from that concept of knowledge being only in the past we're looking to the future discoveries happening every day we've got all these amazing things going on with quantum physics and all the rest of it in terms of the in terms of being a modern freemason because we're modern freemasons how do we deal with that clear tension because i know there's this there's this idea of discovering lost knowledge but is that knowledge always lost as in the past the past context is it lost as in yet to be found in the future as well how do we deal with the development of modern science in terms of how that influences the way we interpret allegories in this degree mm. in this uh, degree yeah because at, at the time that whole concept of lost knowledge would have been as plain as day as darkness visible mm. it, you know instantly would have resonated so it's a good point today you say to someone lost knowledge Yes or no, whether they'd have that same ideal. Some people go, oh, yeah, Atlantis. Yeah. And, yeah. and people would immediately think pyramids. Yes, I mean, how many different theories have you heard on the building of the pyramids? Hundreds. <laughs> uh, are you convinced how they did it? No, I'm not convinced. No, I, don't I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. I don't think anyone is. Yeah. It's fun, fascinating to think about, but yeah. Uh, and it's some of those Egyptian and other temples where you think these things are spot on. They're, they're all perfectly aligned etc how did they do that and that was the concepts at the time so i don't know how many guys today would still make that connection i think some would yes some would go oh yeah i can see what they're on about there but yes 21st century things have changed science has changed we've all got mobile phones in our yeah. pockets yeah. so that concept of lost knowledge when you've got google in your pocket kind of fades a little hang on lost yeah. knowledge hang on i'll just google it for <laughs> let me just find what that is <laughs> let me, yeah. and that's why we have the g in the center of the light yes room. Google. Says google yes I mean, that's a good one that i mean that's the thing that the, the um the cultural difference i guess is that it was a nostalgia there was a it was a sort of a a, a thought that we're missing out on something whereas but in a fashion freemasonry today offers that yes. hint of nostalgia yes it does yeah here's here's a bit of a world gone past yes so you're getting a bit of the old world, but we haven't quite refreshed it enough to give it that the 21st new, century yeah. feel to it. Which is, which is, um, I think that's going to obviously inevitably be a situation where that will change. Hmm. Um, not necessarily disrespecting the landmarks, no, but whatever um, they may be. They may, although some people might find it to be disrespecting some of the landmarks, but I think people generally believe they're living in a unique period, which I think we are, and we're that knowledge is now. Well, we're, we're discovering stuff now. It's all happening now. All the fruits of our labour over these generations are, are culminating to this point. Well, what I'd love to see, and holograms are coming this way, yes. like we have things in a lodge room for those non-Masons. They're called a tracing board. They're a pictorial representation of certain ideas, and there's a story that goes with it that someone gets up and explains. Imagine if that was all as a hologram. It'd be fantastic. So yeah. the guy could actually walk round what he's explaining, a three-dimensional hologram. That's my idea. That would be my ideal of 
21st century Freemason. So you obviously been listening to the Masonic Roundtable? No, no, no. no. I'll, 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 give you some, I'll, I'll give you some good news. In, in, um, I was listening to the Masonic Roundtable, which you can all listen to. It goes live on Tuesdays in the US, um, Central Time, but I think by the time they release it, it comes out about midday for us. Oh, they've done that. Um, basically, in the southern jurisdiction of the Scottish Rite, in one of their new temples, they've got a projector that's in a 360-degree room, which is their temple, and they are going to have the backdrops no longer be painted. They're going to have interactive live... Oh, I think that's a fabulous Yeah, thing. I think it's fantastic, don't you? Um, and that's without changing the essence of Freemasonry. It enhances it by... Bringing it relevant to this century, because yeah. as I said, it's changed with each century. Yeah. Um, if you went to a Freemason's Lodge in the 1600s, you wouldn't know what the hell they were doing. Yes, Because they would have been in a room somewhere, sitting around a table, and <laughs> all of the bits that you see in this room today wouldn't have existed. Yes, exactly right. Um, and if you brought someone in from the 1600s and said, this is a Mason's Lodge room, they'd go, what, what the, you, what what the hell? Are you doing? <laughs> what is this? Um, so yes, it has to change, and yeah. I look forward to those things where yes, I can do a second degree tracing board lecture in a hologram. Yes. I'd love to be able to It'd do be fantastic, that because our tradition. I would also love to be able, when you're talking about the working tools, to pass them round. Yeah, feel them. Yeah. yeah, not just no one's allowed to touch them or even point at. Pass the things around. That's another thing where people, tactile. Well, that's another thing where people in, back in the day would have taken for granted what they were. Whereas today, people have never seen a level or a plumb yeah. rule. What the hell do you mean by? Yeah. I mean, first time someone said to me the plumb rule and the level, I'm looking and going, yeah, okay, that one's a level. <laughs> that one's a, why? That's not coming from the building exactly background. Right. Exactly right. Yeah, we're not all. Yeah. Sort of, yeah, verse. But I, I know guys that have come from building and go, oh, yeah, that one's, yeah, yeah, no, yep. I, can, I can understand that. Well, but for I'm... the sake of us, well, I'm, a, I'm a student lawyer, I'm a lawyer by trade, and I guess. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> don't hold it against me. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where I, I have no relationship with those tools other than the symbolic relationship mm. that I do now have with them. But that's very interesting. Um, okay, well, I, uh, was there anything else that you wanted to cover before we wrap up? I think we've had a fantastic sort of coverage of conversation. Oh, uh, yeah, look, it's. Probably time to shut me up. Nothing else you want to do? No, no, no. I think we've probably covered the main points for Masons and non-Masons. Well, thank you very much for that, Brendan. Um, I think we've covered quite a significant part of the third degree and beyond. We've looked at you know the traditions that influence some of the degrees in Freemasonry and some of the ways we can look to the future about what's to be excited about you know where the degrees are going. On behalf of the Brought to Light Masonic podcast and all the team, I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me. I no hope, problem. Hope you enjoyed it. Thoroughly enjoyed it. And look, I love talking about elements of Freemasonry. I mean, that's why I'm in Lodge of Research. Just love it. So, yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, yeah, probably I've spoken for enough this morning, but yeah, I just love um, discussing these sorts of elements of Freemasonry. Well, I'm glad you came on and thank you again for your time. Oh, uh, yeah, and thank you. And that was the interview with Worshipful Brother Brendan Kine. And what an excellent interview that was. Thank you to Brendan once again for taking the time to come out here and to talk to us about the third degree and also to be so generous with your time. Did you enjoy that? You learned something there? Oh, I think we both learned some stuff there. It was wow, 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 is all I can say, really. Yeah, it's, uh, look, it's, it's, it's interesting. I hope that gives our listeners an idea that in Freemasonry there is no right or wrong. So as you can see, as you probably would have heard, that Brendan and I we're having a bit of a, sh a difference of opinion on the uh, influence of um, the story of Jesus Christ influencing the third degree. Uh, and clearly, uh, as you can see, there's no right or wrong. So Definitely uh, no right or wrong. Everyone's opinions count. Exactly right. And, and symbolism is one of those things where it's just open to interpretation, which is good. So it was a fantastic interview. Um, look, I just want to talk to you, Steve, about what your experiences of the third degree were. Obviously, it was very different. There's a lot of build-up. Let's just mention that there's a lot of build-up to this degree. People say, oh, that's a big degree, and they, you can't do it unless you've been a member for a year. So that's, yeah. that's the, so what was it like for you, that experience? Probably my, my favourite degree, I suppose. I enjoyed all my uh, degree, but uh, when you're faced with the, uh, the mortality side of it, it really gets you thinking. Um, as Brendan mentioned, you can join Rotary and Apex. They're not going to challenge you with that question. Uh, yeah. That's probably all I really enjoyed. And the, you touched on the five points of fellowship there and the, and the, uh, the raising. Um, I had a different idea. It was very interesting to hear Brendan's version of the uh, uh, medieval OHNS, as he called it. Uh, that was that part of the ceremony makes you really contemplate. Uh, I nearly went to sleep during my part of that, but uh, <laughs> I was so relaxed. Uh, I 
I tried to, I was so nervous for my first two degrees, I really went in with a different uh, mindset. Uh, and having been mentored for 12 months, it, it does, they try and, well, they tried to prepare me at my mother lodge for it as best as they could without giving away. And so I really did enjoy it. Yeah, I mean, you made it, you made a very good point. The, the the concept of being on the brink, the very brink of the grave is yeah. the word they use. And um, this concept of, although the degree is about more than death, I think that's a very resonating idea that comes mm. from it the concept that it we is, are is, finite yeah. we're mortal you know and uh, we pass through this life like jim was saying last week with all these worldly possessions and we get to the point where we're faced with the inevitable reality that we're all going to die yes and at that point we have to contemplate what life do we live mm. and i think that during the degree they say something on the lines of um you have nothing to fear when you die if you've lived a life worth living, right? Something in line to that. Yes. Because the idea is, when you face that inevitable reality, you want to know that you've done everything you needed to do. You've lived no a regrets. good life. No regrets. You've contributed to society. Like the 99 World Cup Tour, no regrets. <laughs> no regrets. There you go. Sorry, quote Steve Waugh there. there. It's a bit of a uh, bit of Steve Waugh, uh, Australian cricketer, former Australian cricket captain. Um, look, it's, uh, it's a fantastic degree. And, and, it um, is, it is. One of the things we didn't mention in the interview with Brendan, because uh, we, we really did focus on a lot of the sort of the, the, the less, the less sort of obvious concepts of the degree, is a wonderful charge. It's it's called the Ecclesiastics. Yes. Now there is no one real, of your favourite. I think one Jack, of my isn't I'm it? okay at it. I'm, I, I know I do. Oh, you're more than okay at it, brother. Thank you, sir. As chaplain of the lodge, I served as chaplain for one lodge for a year. Um, which is a fantastic job, and you do all the prayers, and yes. the prayers are written in a way that's actually quite open to any religion or even non-religion. Yes, I was quite disappointed I didn't get the chance to do it. I, I did, did have the I, third degree was done when I was chaplain, but uh, there was a uh, brother that wouldn't budge, and ah, uh, it was his job, and he was, and it's the one job he did, did it really well. Time. So yeah, but uh, you know, I really uh, enjoyed it, and uh, I think you were there, Jack, at the. Uh, Italian Lodge here in Melbourne, the Garibaldi Lodge, mm. uh, and it was uh, a, a brother went through his English, not great, just over from Italy and joined Freemasonry. They did his whole ceremony in English, but they did this particular part in, in Italian. Yes. And uh, knowing the charge as well as I did, I sort of kept up. I don't know Italian, but it was, uh, well, in any language, I think it would be the same. Yeah. It just really rattles, rattles your bones. Well, they, they say that Italian is the, is the language of music. Yes. So it would have sounded fantastic. And Look, we're going to do a reading of Ecclesiastics because although it is part of our ritual, it's actually found in the Bible. Is yeah, it? so originally it wasn't actually uh, in the ritual. Mm. We used to, uh, uh, our brother Wally Dower, uh, who's a, f- a family relative as well, uh, said when he first learned it, he had to, f- had to go buy a Bible to learn it because it yeah. wasn't in the actual ritual book. Yeah. But in terms of, just to give the listeners a bit of an idea of what that... What that uh, charge represents it represents a progression through life and it talks about what happens when you when you age you know it's very confronting you know the concept of um they talk about the almond tree flourishing the almond tree is white and it's talking about how you get white yeah. hair and strong men will bow themselves or bow themselves they'll, they'll they'll sort of the gravity will finally give way and it's a very confronting charge because it makes you think, especially if you're a young person, it makes you contemplate something that's going to happen hopefully a long time. Yes. Now, which is old age. And, you know, how even the strongest men become weak in old age. Yes. So it's a very interesting degree. Uh, and that charge is very important. And that's given in a part of the ceremony, it's very confronting. So um, I'm glad that we've all, we remember that one quite well. And yeah. I hope you enjoy the reading that happens later. Um, one other thing that the third degree does, aside from the actual degree itself, once you complete the third degree, you're able to take office after a year. Yes. You're able to. Which is a, a point of conjecture amongst some in this jurisdiction. Yes. Yep. Uh, the con- we've got a rule here in uh, Victoria that you can only take office in the lodge one year after your your you've been raised to the sublime degree of a master mason. Except for steward. Unless you're a steward which we've all got our views on, and mine is that it's an antiquated approach to things. I, I think that the requirement to be a Master Mason for a year is antiquated in the sense that you need to be a member for a year before you get to become a Master Mason. So you're already looking at two years before you can make a contribution yes. in office, which is considering there are seven officers, including the Master's Chair, 
if you add that extra two years, that's a, that's a nine-year journey, isn't it? And that is that, indeed. And some people say there's no rush, but in an organisation that's shrinking, where young guys are joining to contribute... It's, a, it's the opposite. There are guys that want to be start straight away and there's guys that want to wait. So both of those uh, brethren should be allowed to, in my opinion, uh, to start straight away if they like. Yeah. I know I, know I, I wanted to. Uh, I, I was a month short uh, of a year and uh, my lodge got dispensation to put me into the chaplain a month early. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I would have virtually had to wait um, 23 months. Yep. Yep. from being raised so there are that those uh dispensation uh areas but uh i think you know uh perhaps if it's three months or something like that if they yeah, want to cut it down i, I think if it was if it's a model that i'll i'd support it would be a year but it'd be six months before you can be raised to the sublime degree of a master mason yeah and six months before you could take office yes I think that'd be more realistic. This idea of two-year waiting periods it simply results in people losing interest. It um, does, and yeah. uh, it, I think you, they used to get uh, you know initiated, passed, and raised in, in the space of three months. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's too too quickly, too quick, I think. Yeah, I think, yeah. think but uh, having a couple of months in between yeah. would be possible. Six months, obviously. Yeah. Or, or between you, I meant between first and second. Oh, and yes, then, yeah, and, yeah. And then your second to yeah. third. Uh, but I think. Uh, because you've got to have time to get the MAP programs in there as well. So I definitely need that six-month yeah, period. Absolutely right. I agree. And um, I think that it's important that we understand that different people, like you said, come to the organisation offering different things. So, of course. Um, and, you know, but look, the Master Masons degree opens up your opportunities. It also allows you to join other orders. Now, the this is something we're going to build on later, uh, in later episodes. We're going to do an episode dedicated to the other two degrees in Freemasonry, which is the, the, cra- the, the, the mark sorry, in the chapter. Yes. So there's five degrees in Freemasonry. Article 2 of the Victorian Constitution says there are five degrees in Freemasonry, the three yep. craft degrees, the Mark and the Holy Royal Arch, or the Supreme Degree. The requirement for the chapter is that you, you have... You are still a Mason after three degrees. Yes, you're, you are You are a full, fully-fledged Mason, but the question is whether or not you want to complete that journey. Now, the Mark requires you to be a member for six months. Uh, the chapter requires you to be a member of... A Master Mason, sorry, for six months. Um, so there are ob- avenues available to you. I mean, if you decide office isn't something you want to do yes, and you want to change the journey, you can join other orders. If you decide that you don't want to join the other orders, you can take up office. If you don't want to take up office, you just want to give charges, you can do that. If you want to do nothing and sit back and come to lodge meetings, that's also fine as well. Of course it is. So the world is at your feet. Up, up until the point when you become a Master Mason, you're sort of... You're mentored significantly. You hand, you're held by the hand. But when you get to the point where you finish your third degree, you're on not you're on your own, but you're sort of like the bird being kicked out the nest. You know, you're you're off to learn how to fly and learn how to. Your you point isn't guarded. Yeah, you, you're not held by the hand. So that's yes. So we are men, and we do hold hands. Yes, real men hold hands, and the, the and wear be- aprons. <laughs> and wear aprons, and the benefit of doing that is that you start your journey to your broader Masonic experience. So third degree is really important. I'm glad you enjoyed the interview with Brent. Oh, it was magnificent. I forgot he was also the uh, Western, one of the Western District uh, Education Officers and yeah. delivers the map himself. He's a, the one district I haven't got to yet. Uh, well, I've done a lot and visited other districts, but uh, it'll be interesting to see his take on that when I go visit him. Yeah, we should go. Uh, I'd encourage people to visit uh, Brendan's maps as well. And I, both Brendan and James do a fantastic job. But as you would have noticed over the interviews, they do they approach it in a different way, which, exactly. is, which is a good highlight of what Freemasonry is all about. Okay, Steve, we'll, we'll think we'll wrap it up there. Um, thank you very much for co-hosting today, the Brought My to Light Mason podcast. Look forward to being back again. We'll have you back again. And uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, go into a reading of Ecclesiastics, uh, which is in the book of Ecclesiastics in the Old Testament. Until next time, thank you for listening to the Brought to Light Masonic podcast. I'm your host, Brother Jack Aquilina, and we'll speak to you at our next edition. The charge entitled Ecclesiastics is one of the most important in the third degree. In fact, for myself, it was one of the most impressionable charges that was given and still sits with me to this very day. It leaves an impression of what it is we have to think about what happens in old age and it is taken its source being the old testament of the king james version of the christian bible and in that version there is in the book of ecclesiastics verse 12 a very the very version that we use in our rituals the version used in our rituals however is a variation on the version i'm about to read 
We do not reveal Masonic ritual here on this podcast. However, I will be reading exactly from verse 12 of Ecclesiastics, the King James Bible, the Ecclesiastics, which inspired the charge that I remember so much. Remember now, thy creator, in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them, while the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble, and the strong men shall bow themselves, and the grinders cease because they are few, and those who peer out their windows shall be darkened. And the doors shall be shut in the streets, when the sound of the grinding is low, and he shall rise up to the voice of the bird, and the daughters of music shall be brought low. Also when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fears shall be in the way, and the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshoppers shall become a burden, and all desire shall fail. For man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets. Or ever the silver cord be loosened, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheels be broken at the cistern, then shall the dust return unto the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed, and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads, and as nails fastened by the master of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. And further, these, my son, be admonished, of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man, for God shall bring every work into judgment, with every secret, whether it be good, or whether it be evil. You've been listening to the Brought to Light Masonic Podcast, bringing you to light through discussions and research papers about Australian Freemasonry and the Victorian jurisdiction in particular. We look forward to speaking to you on our next edition, and until then, we're happy to meet, sorry to part, and happy to meet again.